Amen. Hallelujah. Are we excited to be in God's house this morning? Come on now. I need a witness or two. Are we excited to be in God's house this morning? That's one of those dangerous songs you just sing. Oh, set a fire down in my soul. Oh, hallelujah. That I can't contain, that I can't control. That is a dangerous prayer. Sing it with caution because when he starts, just read the book of Acts. Interesting things begin to happen. Hallelujah. Are we again excited to be in God's house this morning? Come on, I don't know about you, but God has been way too good to me for me to just be passive in his presence. Hallelujah. I need someone to be excited. I don't care what culture you're from. I don't care in the church you grew up, if you didn't clap or you didn't shout, but we are in God's house this morning. Are we excited? Hallelujah. Are we expectant for a move of God? Are we excited for God to do something? Hallelujah. That we've never seen him do before. We're asking him to set a fire. We're asking him to burn in our souls. Hallelujah. We're asking the Holy Spirit to have his way in our lives. And I tell you, he begins to answer that prayer. Good things begin to happen. Lives begin to change. Marriages begin to be restored. Hallelujah. Miracles, signs, and wonders continue to take place, and we give God the glory, the praise, and the honor. Amen. Do you still love me? Hallelujah. Uh, my name is Steve. Uh, I'm part of LifeBridge here. I've been for the last 11 plus years, and it, um, it's just an honor and a privilege to be able to share the word with you today. And uh, Pastor Bill and Grace are not here with us this Sunday. They are, as you saw on the video, uh, just living the dream out there in Israel, I tell you, those people. Uh, but no, we celebrate with the team that's out there. Um, they're having fun, and we cannot wait to hear the testimonies that they will uh, bring back with us today. And uh, just for, for this few moments, uh, I just want to share the gospel with you, amen? Uh, the good news, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm honored today uh, that I get to share with my, my home church, my family. And I, and I hope that you came expectant. I, I hope you came hungry. Because the Bible declares those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake shall be filled. And I pray, that is my prayer this morning. You will not come, if, if you came empty, you will not leave empty. If you came hungry, you will not leave hungry. You will, you will go home with a full stomach. Amen. Your spirit man or woman will be filled, will be filled that you will have such a beautiful encounter with King Jesus for the next few moments that you cannot contain it or control. You will just overflow. Hallelujah. As you step into your week. Amen. And with that, let's jump into the scripture. Today I'll be reading from the book of 1 Kings. Uh, bear with me, we have a lot of uh, verses to go through, but I promise we will get there. Look at your neighbor and say, be patient with him. Good things are coming. And so the Bible declares, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. The brother was tired. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went into the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And we skip now to verses 13. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Ask yourself, what are you doing here? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. 
And the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And then you can breathe now and say, finally. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. This morning I want to uh, just share a simple message. And my word to you today is do not give up. So the Bible introduces us to this character. His name was Elijah. And if you read 1 uh, Kings 17 and 18, you see that Elijah was just not uh, another man in the neighborhood. Hallelujah. Uh, he was uh, a man of God, and, num and number two, he was a prophet. Not only did he prophesy, but uh, he was uh, a prophet. God had specifically chosen him as his mouthpiece to the nation of Israel. And the Bible tells us in 1 King, Kings chapter 18 that Elijah had this encounter with God that was, that was really powerful. Perhaps if you know the story that he gathered all the prophets of Baal. Who were the prophets of Baal? They were in essence, uh, or priests of Baal, these were people who worshipped a foreign god other than Jehovah God, the king of Israel. And so Elijah gathers all these people and he says, hey, come, I have a test for you. And they go and they make... Um, these two altars, one for uh, the prophets of Baal and the priests of Baal and one for uh, the king of kings and the lord of lords. And Elijah tells the false prophets, hey, uh, go ahead, we've slaughtered this bull, we've set up the altar, call on your God and, uh, and I will call on my God. Whoever, whoever's God sends fire down to come and burn that sacrifice, then we will know who the true God is. The saga continues. So the Bible says that uh, the prophets of Baal start and, you know, they're over there calling unto God and they call on him for a while. Elijah mocks them a little bit uh, and then they start uh, cutting themselves in, in, in order to try to evoke this false God to come and, and hear their prayer and burn their sacrifice. And lo and behold, nothing happens. And then Elijah's turn. And when Elijah calls on God... He does something to make things even more interesting. Have you ever watched a movie and you're like, man, and then there was more, right? You thought you knew the, the plot line and then you're like, ooh, there's more. There's, there's some good things coming. And so Elijah tells, these, uh, tells the people who are helping him, hey, go grab these jars of water and just flood this sacrifice with water. Now, if, forgive me, I don't have a lot of camping experience, but... One would think, if you're going to set firewood on fire, the last thing you want to do is put water on it. It, it doesn't work out very well. If you care for your lungs, you probably shouldn't do that, you know. Uh, but so they go and pour the water. They're probably looking at Elijah going, sir, what kind of coffee did you have this morning? Uh, and then he prays to God. And something wonderful happens. God answers. The fire falls. Now here is where it gets even more interesting. Not only does the fire burn the sacrifice, the Bible says it burnt the, it uh, sucked up all the water. It burnt, it burnt even the stone and the dust. Now that was a hot fire. Hallelujah. So when you pray out a fire, just saying, uh, but no. So here's Elijah having triumphed and shown who the God, the true God of Israel was. And then, uh, he orders the people, okay, we've now uh, recognized who God is. Let's take care of these characters. And the Bible says over 400 of those false prophets uh, came to their demise. And then 
uh, at this time there had been a drought in Israel for over three years. And so things are already bad, right? And God tells them, okay, hey, I'm sending the rain back. So uh, that beautiful song we sing, there is a cloud. Uh, and Elijah and his servant go to the mountain. And the seventh time he sees the cloud the size of a fist coming. Uh, and he runs to uh, King Ahab and tells him, hey, the rain's coming and it rains. And it's just a wonderful time. So here's Elijah, a man who has seen God move Powerfully, a man who's been used of God to speak to King Ahab and to the Israelites and to be an agent of hope and, uh, and doom in some cases because he had to give them some bad news, but all to try to bring them back to a place of repentance to God. And here's Elijah having seen God do such miraculous and powerful things. And then in 1 Kings 19, uh, King Ahab had a wife. His, her name was Jezebel. She was the one who'd brought uh, this practice of false worship uh, to the people of Israel. She'd raised up altars and all these bad things were happening as a result of that. And so Jezebel uh, proclaims, hey, in a day's time, Brother Elijah's not going to be living any time longer. He had a warrant out for his arrest and unfortunately for his death. And so you would imagine after Elijah just saw God do what he did the chapter before. He would be like, Jezebel, I'm about to show you. Nope. What does he do? The Bible says the brother ran. He ran and hid. He was so afraid, he left his servant in one place, and then he went a day's journey all the way to another place to hide from God, or to hide from uh, Queen Jezebel and King Ahab uh, subsequently. And then he says, it is, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. For I am no better than my father's. Like he was ready to die. He was in such despair. He was so afraid. It looked like, it felt like, it seemed like everything was going against him. Hallelujah. But then God intervened. Isn't it beautiful? When things look like they're uh, irreparable. When it feels like, when it seems like, when it looks like. Everything is against you. And then God steps into the picture. Then God intervened, and Elijah got to experience a supernatural Grubhub, DoorDash, waiter on the way, whatever your favorite food service is, uh, Uber Eats, and God sends this wonderful angel and tells Elijah, uh, sir, you need to eat, brother. You have a long journey ahead of you. Uh, you know, Elijah wakes up, and he's like, okay, I'm going to eat a little bit. Then the angel again is like, uh, sir, I don't think you understand. I, I need you to eat. And this must have been some pizza or some burger, or I mean, this must have been some food. Can you imagine eating one meal that takes you for 40 days? You know, Jesus uh, fasted and then he ate. The brother ate and then he fasted for 40 days. 40 long days walking in the wilderness. And he goes to Mount Horeb. And then again, God appears to him. We miss a couple of verses there, but God appears to him and asks him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he gives that same excuse. He said, Lord, I have been very jealous for you. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now we start to begin to get a deeper picture of what Elijah was dealing with. He felt so alone. He felt so in despair, even though he had seen God move powerfully. And if you read in, uh, again, 1 Kings uh, 17 as well, you'll see when he proclaimed, by the way, he's the guy who proclaimed the drought in the first place, just so you know. Um, he had seen a young boy raised to life, the widow of Zarephath's son. Um, he had seen God again do these many things, but he gets to a point where because Jezebel proclaimed death upon him, he felt like, Lord, in essence, all the work I have done as your prophet was for nothing. Lord, the Israelites are going in a different direction than what I thought they were supposed to go in. Lord, not only are they uh, breaking down altars that were set up for you to worship you as God, now they're killing prophets like me. And Lord, I am the only one left. They seek my life to take it away. Just Lord, take me out of the picture. I'm done. It's not worth it. But God, hallelujah, but God. 
Then God had to remind him. He had to have uh, what some of us like to call a come to Jesus moment. He had to have some words of encouragement. He had to give him some humble pie. And God does this beautiful thing. He says, all right, Elijah, you're at the mount. You're in a cave at this point. You know, he's cowering in the cave. God says, uh, Brother Elijah, I need you to come out of the cave. Brother Elijah, of course, obeys. It's kind of a good idea to listen to God when he tells you to do something. Um, and so Elijah comes out. And God, a powerful wind comes through. And the Bible says, and God was not in it. Then the Bible says an earthquake came through, but God was not in it. Fire, again, comes through, but God wasn't in it. And then a still, small voice. Hallelujah. And then Elijah comes out again, and God asks him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And there's Elijah again. Lord, you know, he, he starts playing that fiddle. Gives the story again. And then God says, okay, I'm going to have mercy on you. But then we're going to alternate the plan a little bit. He says, here are these three people from the land of Syria. We're going to anoint King Hazel. From uh, the land uh, in Israel, we're going to lift up this army commander called Jehu. He did some mighty things for God. Later on, he's responsible for bringing justice to uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Naboth who was uh, killed by King Ahab and, Elisha, and uh, Queen Jezebel. We're going to raise this man up. And then he says, and then there's this other brother you haven't heard of before. His name is Elisha. You're going to anoint him too to take your place. So Elisha said, all right. And the Bible says he made that track back to where he was supposed to go to. And then we get this introduction to this young man, or maybe he was in his middle age, I don't know. This, this person by the name of Elisha. Now, Elisha, compared to Elijah, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot of things about his life before he met Elisha, but it does give us some context. Here is Elisha being faithful in farming. He had his Chevy Dooley, you know, just living the, the farm dream out there. He had his tractors. He and John Deere were friends. They had a one-to-one -one relationship. Hallelujah. He had, him, he had him on his speed dial. He could call him, but here's brother Elisha being faithful in the farm, right? He's tilling the ground. He's going on about business as usual. But then suddenly, here comes Elijah, throws his cloak on him and keeps going. And Elisha had to stop and realize something just happened. This is not business as usual. Something just happened. And he runs after Elijah and he says, uh, sir, I think I have a feeling about what's going on here, but before I pursue you, before I go with you, can I go and say goodbye to my family? And I don't know if Elijah was saying it, you know, the Bible doesn't insert, it doesn't have a bracket or parentheses where it says inserts sarcasm and then uh, it continues the rest of the story. But all we know is Elijah told Elisha, hey, you do what you need to do, I'm, I'm walking. It's on you to see if you want to follow me or not. And the Bible says, and I believe Elisha realized what was happening. He counted the cost. And he came to a place of peace and he realized it was worth it. And he took the very thing that was his livelihood, the very thing that was his identity, the very thing that helped him to be who he was up until that point. And the Bible says he slaughtered uh, his cattle. He made a sacrifice and he shared a meal with his people. And then he ran and pursued Elijah. The Bible says he assisted Elijah. If you've read the Bible, you, you continue to hear about how the story of Elisha works out. The story of Elisha is, is, is even more powerful. This guy, number one, don't you ever make fun of a bald prophet. You might have a new revelation of the bare necessities. That's a good one, right? Take that home. Put it on a t-shirt. Hallelujah. Mm. And so Elisha has... So, when, so what, what uh, I guess, let me, let me track back a little bit. So before Elijah gets out completely out of the picture, Elisha follows him. And the Bible says three different times uh, he had an opportunity to not follow Elijah. But he kept pursuing. And then, again, it's one of those things you read and you're like, wow. 
Then there's another supernatural Uber experience. Chariots from fire come down. Elijah goes up to heaven. Elisha gets the double anointing and he continues to move in power. So much so that when Elisha died, we just sang it a few moments ago. When Elisha died, now this brother is dead. D-E-A-D exclamation mark, dead. He was so dead that when someone was thrown into his grave, the guy came back to life. What kind of anointing is that? Can you imagine? We bury you today, and then by accident, someone happens to land on your grave who's also dead. They rise up. No big deal. You know, just another day. Another day in Israel. No big deal. But we see God do something really powerful here. A mantle was placed on Elisha that continued the work that God had started in Elijah. And I want to speak to some of the Elijahs in the room today. You've been doing ministry, you've been doing business, you've been faithful in what God has called you to do. You have done great and mighty things. You have seen the goodness of God. You can tell testimony after testimony. If it, if it was 2022 and Elijah was there, you'd have a documentary. You'd probably have books in the shelves. You'd have a lot going on for you. You've seen fire, maybe not literally fall from heaven, but you've seen the fire of God at work in the lives of people. You've seen the dead raised to life. You've seen God do so many amazing things. But something happens that steals your joy. Something happens that makes you want to give up. Maybe you are at a church and, and people forsook, uh, forsook you. Maybe you had some uh, business deals that seemed like they were going on and everything fell through. Maybe everything in your family seemed like you were, like Job perhaps, you were the epitome of what a godly family needs to look like. And something happened. And you felt so afraid and so distraught that you said, God, just, it is better if you take me out of the picture. It is better if I'm not around because it feels like things are getting worse and worse. Lord, have you turned on the TV lately? Nothing feels encouraging anymore. Everything seems like it's just going down. Lord, take me out. I'm done. Yes, I've seen you do some amazing things, but God, I'm done. If that's you today, do not give up. God's not done with you yet. I want to speak to the Elishas in the room too. You've been faithful in what I like to call the tent-making phase of your life. You're faithful in what's right in front of you. You've kept, you've been moving one step at a time. Whether like Elisha, you have that wonderful far farm and you're plowing the ground, you're cultivating, you're doing everything you need to do. You've, you, you're, you're being uh, willing and ready to serve where God has placed you now. And again, the Bible doesn't tell us if Elisha had dreams of being a prophet one day. The Bible doesn't tell us what Elisha was thinking when he sat down in his bed at night. But then, if part of you it's like, God, maybe you received a word many years ago. Maybe people have always encouraged you to, to go beyond what is what you're doing now. And you're saying, I'm not sure if I have what it takes. Keep on trusting. Elijah's coming. And it may not be in Elijah's case where a literal Elijah or a man of God or a woman of God will come and literally put their coat on you and tell you, follow me. But God still has a wonderful plan for your life. Church, we cannot afford to give up. Whether we find ourselves more relating more with Elijah or relating more with Elisha, pre-Elijah coming. We cannot afford to give up. God is still moving. God is still moving, church. God is still healing. God is still restoring. You may feel like you're the only one going through what you're going through. And may I remind you when we read the last part of uh, first or the middle part of First Kings 19, God told Elijah, by the way, it's not only you who's left and this three people you're going to be anointing. There are 7,000 more <laughs> prophets doing my work. So Elijah, you're not on your own. Stop playing the fiddle. Pick some drums or something. I don't know. We cannot afford to give up. 
And I don't know if you're waiting for God to call fire from heaven so that you finally believe he is God. I don't know if you're waiting on someone to come put a coat around you and say, okay, let's go. It may not happen exactly the way it did for Elijah and Elisha. But the same God, come on now, the same God loves you. The same God is passionate about you. The same God has a calling on your life that I would strongly encourage you to pursue him until he brings it to full completion. That same God, the same God whose fire was so hot it burned up everything in its way, that same God will consume, will consume every aspect of your life. He will bring joy where there feels to be no joy. He will bring back hope where there feels to be no hope. And if it means like Elisha, you have to pay a price, and I promise you there is a price to pay when you follow Christ. It is worth it. I'm not saying that you'll go home today and God will say, you know, sell your house or uh, tell your family goodbye and move to, you know, we'll say like Rod or something. I don't know. And he might. God is God. Hallelujah. Our part is not to question whether he's got our, our part is to say, Lord, I'm willing even if I don't understand. And if he does ask you to pay that price, like Elisha, will you pay that price and do it with joy? Do not give up, church. Do not give up. I don't read your mail. I don't sit in your living room and know what conversations you have. But God is not done with you yet. When we sing songs like Set a Fire, oh man, I, I begin to get excited. Because I know, there, there are times maybe like Elijah, I've gone through some things and I'm like, Lord, woo, I don't know if I have the strength to keep going. But he restores me and renews me and refreshes me and I keep going. And there are times I feel like Elisha, I am holding on to the promises of God. And there are things, church, I tell you, that I am trusting God for. And sometimes it feels like they may not happen. But when I sing songs like Set a Fire, the Lord reminds me, hey, I'm still coming. Hallelujah. I'm still doing, I'm still the same God who brought you to this place. I'm still the same God who gave you that farm equipment. Come on. I'm still the same God. Do not give up. Do not give up. Instead, make room for God to do whatever he wants to. I'm going to say that again. Do not give up. And I don't mean like the poetic, don't give up, but give up. No. Do not give up. Make room for God to do whatever he wants to. There's a really cool song that I heard earlier this week. I'd heard it a couple years before when it first came out. But I heard it again this week and I was like, oh, that would tie so wonderfully with the message. It's by a church called Community uh, Music. If, if you hang around me, I, I love music. I can't sing like Joe. I'm not going to try. But the Bible does say make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So whether it is joyful or noisy, I'm, I'm singing. And this is how, how the lyrics go. They say, here is where I lay it down. Every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And then the chorus just takes it to a whole deeper level. And I will make room for you. In essence, we're saying, Lord, I'm surrendering and making room for you to do whatever you want to. And they say it again, to do whatever you want to. Lord, I will make room for you. Lord, I feel like Elijah. 
I feel like I'm the only one left. I feel like I've, I've tried to run the race to the best of my ability. Lord, I've seen you do miracle signs and wonders that I cannot explain. But right now, I feel like I want just to be out of the picture. But God, I, I recognize that I, I need to surrender every lie, every doubt. And I am making room for you. If you're like Elisha, you're saying, God, I've, I've been faithful in what's before me. But maybe a part of me longs for something more. Lord, I am making room for you to do that something more. Lord, do whatever you want to. Lord, do whatever you want to. And then the bridge just is the icing on the cake. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Again, one of those dangerous prayers. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. How powerful are those words? We're saying, Lord, we can't give up. God is not done yet. I just want to speak to, to all of us and those who are watching online. I want us to take inventory right now and think about everything that God has done for you. Think about all the miracles you've experienced personally. Perhaps some that you've seen all around you. Think of all the victories and the joy and the times of celebration and jubilation. And also think about the times it was hard. The times when it felt like oxygen was being sucked up out of the room and you couldn't breathe. When you woke up at night or you couldn't go to bed because you had so much on your heart and on your mind. And how God came through for you. Lord, we're choosing to make room for you right now. Mm. So I just want, if there's anyone in the room, again, I don't know your story. I don't know your, uh, your background. But I know here in this moment, God is speaking. Here in this moment, God is moving. For some who feel like Elijah, God's refreshing you right now. For those who feel like Elisha, God is making room for you for what's ahead. And if you're willing and you're saying, yes, Lord, I can, I can relate with that. Yes, Lord, I feel like, like I'm part of that number. You just raise your hand or stand up, whatever you'd like to do. Prayer team, feel free to come up. I just want us to be honest with God for a moment. I'm not here to put you on the spot. And if, if you feel like that, that's not my intention by any stretch of the imagination. But I need us to be real with God for just a moment. Someone needed to hear this today. Do not, do not give up. And you're saying, yes, Lord, that's me. Let me start with Elijah. Lord, you're saying, yes, that's me. Right now, Lord, life is too hard. Life is too hard, Lord. I, I can't breathe. Lord, I, I can't open my mouth. I can barely lift up my hands in the morning to worship you. Lord, I can barely look at my Bible. Because, Lord, it feels too hard, God. I don't know. I don't know if I can, if I can make it anymore. And God is saying, do not give up. He's saying he loves you. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you. And if that's you... Raise your hand, stand up, do whatever you need to. God wants to encounter you in this place right now. And to the Elishas, if you are, you've been faithful in what you're doing, but you know your heart is beating for something more. You can barely put words on what that is, but you know there is something. There is something stirring up in your spirit. And you're like, God, I need you to move on my behalf. I need you to do only that which you can do. God, I am making room for you this morning. Oh, if you need to stand up, stand up. If you need to come to the front, just come to the altar. Come on, church. God wants to encounter you today. We cannot afford to give up. God's too good for us to do that. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, oh, we give you the glory. Mm.
God, we give you the glory and we make room for you right now. Oh, Holy Spirit, have your way. Oh, Lord, breathe upon us right now and just remind us that you are here. Open blind eyes to see you right now, God. Open deaf and ears to begin to hear your voice once more. Oh God, break down the walls that we've raised up. God, the things that we have done that perhaps have separated us from you, Lord, we repent now and we make room for you. Oh God, restore unto us the joy of salvation. Restore unto us the passion for your name. Oh, thank you, Lord. God, we make room for you this morning. We cannot afford to live without you. God, you have been way too good for us to continue feeling as if you're not there. God, awaken us to the reality of the depth of your heart this morning. And God, for those of us who are expectant for what is ahead, God, for those of us who've been yearning to see you bring forth the fullness of your heart, we welcome you and we make room, God. We count the cost and we have declared that you are worth it. We will pay it because you are too good, God. And some of you came in this morning and you don't know Jesus as the Lord, as your Lord and Savior. You're like, see if it's good for the Elijahs and the Elishas. At least they have something. I don't have anything. It has been me, myself, and I up until this point. And you're saying, whether you're here in the service or online, you are trusting and believing that, yes, there is a better way. That, yes, there is an answer. That, yes, there is hope. His name is Jesus. And if you're willing and if you're ready... He wants to come and be in your life. He wants to transform you. He wants to heal. He wants to give you a hope for the present and for the future. He wants to wash away your sins. And if that's you, I just want you to say the simple words. Jesus, I give you my life. And after you make that prayer, you're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Hallelujah. Come and talk to the prayer team. Or you can go to the connection and say, Today I made the decision to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. What do I do next? We have some awesome groups for you to get plugged in with. We'll bless you with the Bible. And you're part of a church that is passionate about the things of God. We'll grow with you and walk with you. You're not alone. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we worship you, King Jesus. Where you are, can you just begin to worship God? Can you just tell him how good he is? Can you just glorify his name? Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you, Lord, for your presence that is in this place, Lord. Lord, you declare that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We thank you for your freedom in this place this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for we want to know you more. And Lord, you fill us, you, you, en- you enthrone us, Lord God. With your love and with your, with your peace and your joy. And God, we just worship you right now. We join the 24 elders. We join the four living creatures. We join the church of Christ across this country, across the nations of the world. And we just declare you are holy. Yes, Lord, you are holy. Thank you, Lord. This day and every day this week, we make room for you. This day and every day in our businesses, in our homes, in our churches, God, everywhere that we go, Lord God, we make room for you to do whatever you want to because we know your way is better. Thank you, Lord. Amen.